When I look at gorillas, I feel that they are very majestic and powerful, but at the same time they are they're very vulnerable because they're so few in number. I want to make sure that the wildlife is there for future generations. I also want to make sure that the people living next to the wildlife appreciate the wildlife and to feel that this is for us, this is our future. Because without their support, the wildlife can't survive. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be able to present today at the Wildlife Conservation Network Expo. Thank you very much for inviting us to present. And my presentation is going to be talking about our work at Conservation Through Public Health, where we promote gorilla conservation through a One Health approach and how we've used this approach to address the COVID-19 pandemic. I've been working with mountain gorillas for 25 years, starting out as a vet student and later setting up the first veterinary unit in the Uganda Wildlife Authority, and then later founding Conservation Through Public Health. I'm a National Geographic Explorer and have ever received the Sierra Club Earth Care Award, and this year received the Aldo Leopard Award, which we're really pleased about. Mountain gorillas are one of the most endangered species on Earth. However, recently they were removed from the critically endangered list because they're slowly growing. And since I first started working with them, their numbers have doubled, almost doubled from 600 to 1,063. And however, when you come to Bwindi Impenetrable National Park, you find a very hard edge. I was struck by this when I first came in as a vet student. And once you get to the park, it abruptly stops and you start the forest. And so when it was created as a national park in 1992, people were not allowed to go in anymore, but gorillas sometimes come out. And this has resulted in human wildlife conflicts where gorillas come out to eat people's banana plants because now once they lose their fear of people after being habituated for tourism and research, they come out to their former ranges around the park. And this resulted in gorillas getting a scabies skin disease, which was traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. They found dirty clothing on a scarecrow that people put out to scare away wildlife that can destroy their banana plants, like over here. So gorillas are generally threatened by habitat loss and uh, poaching, not so much for gorillas in Uganda, but for other animals in the forest like dica and bush pig, which I'll get to show you later in the presentation. But however, gorillas in other parts of Africa are threatened mainly by habitat loss. And actually in some parts of Africa, gorillas are also killed and eaten. We started, we decided to focus not only on the health of the gorillas, but also the health of the people living around the park. And also we decided not to only focus on gorillas as a species, but also their habitat. So we promote wildlife conservation and community health together. And we also found that many people are unhealthy because they were poor. So we started an alternative livelihoods program. And within it, we started a social enterprise to support coffee farmers around the park called Gorilla Conservation Coffee, which I'm going to talk about later in the presentation. And using this integrated approach to conservation, we are trying to address all these various threats to gorillas all over Africa. When the COVID pandemic began in March 2020 in Uganda, um, I often got asked whether great apes are susceptible to COVID-19 and whether we need to be worried about them as well. And the virus having come from bats and an intermediate host that is not yet known was able to jump to people in the Wuhan market because of the very poor animal welfare there and eventually it spread very quickly in people and with lockdowns all over the world and a cessation of tourism, um, we're then worried that the virus could actually jump from people to the great apes. A coronavirus is part of the normal common flu viruses, um, except it's a much more severe one and great apes have been affected by common flu viruses. The human metonema virus in mountain gorillas in Rwanda, the human rhino sea virus in chimps in Uganda and the human coronavirus in wild chimps in Ivory Coast, although it was mild and none of them died. 
and it's also spread to tigers and lions, cats, dogs, and farmed mink from asymptomatic keepers. It's likely we've not yet had any COVID-19 spreading to gorillas, especially in the wild, but humans, gorillas, and other old world primates have similar protein receptors that make them highly susceptible to the virus, which causes COVID-19. So one area that we were very concerned about was tourists visiting the gorillas and making them sick. I was hired as a first veterinarian for this one reason. And although the first disease that has affected the gorillas has been from the local communities at Buindi, we were concerned that now with COVID-19, the gorillas now had an additional threat. When you get to Buindi, you find that you have to stand, you have to, you, you have to stand and listen to a presentation in the morning before you go tracking, which is very exciting. And they always emphasize the seven meter distance to prevent disease transmission using the seven meter distance rule. However, we did some research with Ohio University and found that almost all the time, gorillas and people got too close to each other. And 60% of the time, the tourists got too close. And 40% of the time, it was the gorillas that broke the rules because the gorillas have grown up seeing people. Um, the gorilla that I showed in in the first couple of slides, has grown up seeing people all his life. He's my favorite gorilla. And gorillas like him even like to frighten tourists and see their reaction. So the gorillas are so used to people and this makes them likely to pick up diseases from us very easily. So we, it, we thought that it was really urgent to hold ranger training workshops as the pandemic was beginning to get them to learn to put on masks when they're visiting gorillas to really enforce that distance so that we can really minimize the risk of us making the gorillas sick and also to get people to check for people who are sick before they track. And although that rule has always been there, um, we found out that some people may not be showing signs of cough or flu, but they have a high temperature. The very first index case in Uganda was a returning Ugandan coming to Uganda from Dubai, and he had a very high temperature, but no flu or cough. So here we, I was taking a temperature from of the Brindy Community Hospital who helped in the training and trying to show people that with non-contact infrared thermometers, it's possible to take a, safely take someone's temperature without picking up their disease and determine whether or not they should go into the park and track the gorillas. We did this training with the Wildlife Authority who manages the wildlife in Uganda, the government agency and other non-profits like Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, International Gorilla Conservation Program and the Max Planck Institute. So as a result of this training that started at the beginning of the pandemic, the great ape viewing regulations have been upgraded. Whenever people are visiting the great apes, they have to maintain actually a distance of 10 meters, which was increased from seven to 10. The wildlife authority increased it because of the pandemic. Everyone has to wear a mask when they visit the gorillas. And we have very strict hand hygiene before you go up to track them. And of course, if you're sick, you're not allowed up. We, when we went to track the gorillas the next day after the training, um, together with the rangers. It rained very heavily and we're really glad to be wearing cloth masks because we were able to continue wearing them even during the rain. And we donated infrared thermometers to the Wildlife Authority so that they can now use them at all the sites from tracking. And we also got other nonprofits to donate to them and other researchers. And so we needed to make sure that they don't pick up any diseases during the pandemic. And so what we did is we trained the gorilla guardians who are local community members as well, local volunteers who are trained to safely herd gorillas back in the park when they come out. And so we trained the human gorilla conflict team um, with support from the conservation warden, community conservation warden, and talked to them about the fact that they should not get closer than 10 meters when herding the animals back and they should wear masks. So we got them masks as well. And also they shouldn't herd the gorillas when they have high temperatures. So we did, we managed to do all that training and we used posters um, that were developed actually by Solidaridad and they, we added a picture of a gorilla on it. And because really the COVID-19 training was not only about preventing disease from people to gorillas, but preventing disease between people. So we emphasize the whole issue of social distancing, hand hygiene and wearing of masks and with support from the ACAS Foundation we were able to train 
the guerrilla guardians and the village health and conservation teams. And so now they know that if gorillas come out, they have to call out the gorilla guardians. We also gave them soap to really enforce, reinforce hand hygiene. Because these same volunteers are visited by people who want to get family planning injections. They have been promoting good hygiene and sanitation, but now was an opportunity to reinforce the message and to re also reinforce the message of if you're sick, if you have a respiratory disease, please refer yourself to the health centers. So this was a great opportunity to reinforce what we were already doing, but really focus on preventing COVID-19 between people and gorillas. Um, these masks were made by Ride for a Woman and the masks that we used during the training, they were about to lay off all their staff during COVID. And then we called them and said, please, are you able to make masks? Um, because they're used to selling crafts and really beautiful local Bitenji cloth to tourists, but tourists were not coming anymore. And so they were able to make masks and keep women employed. And that meant that there were fewer people who needed to enter the forest because they were hungry, because they didn't have money from tourism anymore. And what else did we do in the absence of tourism? We've been supporting coffee farmers around Bwindi since 2016, when we set up the Guerrilla Conservation Coffee Social Enterprise, because we found that these farmers were not getting a steady market or a fair price. And yet when you're tracking gorillas, you often cross coffee farms. And not everyone could be a ranger or a porter benefiting from the tourism industry. And we felt that we needed to support them. So one of the aims of conservation through public health is to take a look at improving the livelihoods of people in and around protected areas of Africa. And this led us to start Guerrilla Conservation Coffee, which buys coffee at a premium from farmers living in sub-counties bordering Windy. I used to do hunting within the, the park. Now I grow coffee. Working with City Pitch is good. We have benefited much from them. Also, I can get money to pay school fees for my children. So the life of the people around the community is now changing. In the photo over here, I was in the duty-free shop at the airport at Intebe. They were our biggest buyer of Gorilla Conservation coffee because whenever people buy coffee, we're able to also give a donation back to support the work of CTPH to improve community health, guerrilla health, and conservation education. But at this time, we were not able to um, buy, they haven't bought any coffee from us since March. And we thought, what do we do if we're to, to continue to support the farmers, which is really important, especially now during the pandemic when there's no revenue coming in from tourism. And so having started to sell it in Uganda and US through pangos.com, um, and New Zealand, South Africa, and also the UK, we, we found that we really needed to look for new buyers. And during the pandemic, we were able to get a new buyer in the UK, our very first distributor, Money Row Beans, and they were able to buy coffee and place three orders since May. Unfortunately, in the US, they were not able to place an order because they ran out of coffee and flights were not flying to America, but they should be able to start flying in October. And in this way, we we're able to buy coffee from the farmers because, and the money that we got from Money Row Beans enabled us to give people a revenue even during the pandemic when no tourists were coming. However, we had a severe setback. At the beginning of June, uh, Rafiki, a very friendly gorilla at Bwindi and heading the Kuringo Gorilla Group, was killed by a poacher. And he was killed by a poacher because he's so used to people. He was, comes from a group that was one of the first groups to be habituated in Bwindi. Um, and ever since he's been a baby, he was seeing people habituating his group. So he grew up knowing that people are good and couldn't tell the difference between a good person and a bad person. This poacher entered the park because he wanted to hunt daika and bush pig to eat. And he came across Rafiki, got scared, panicked and speared him. And unfortunately, Rafiki died and his group disintegrated a bit. The 17 gorillas reduced to 11. Some of them left and went to another group. And it's, it was really sad what happened. This poacher was arrested and eventually charged for 11 years in jail, which was an improvement because normally when poachers were caught, like nine years before that, they didn't receive a severe sentence like this. And so it was an upgrade in the regulations and we hope it's deterrent enough and will stop other poachers going in. However, one thing that we realized is that this particular poacher was very poor and, and very vulnerable and hungry. And there were many of them like him who are waiting to enter the forest 
to, to, to poach and kill animals because they're so desperate. The three females with babies were doing well, and Ramutwe, who's the eldest black buck, he's still a young man, not yet silvered, had now taken over the group and was really looking after his group members, which is great. We checked on their fecal samples and they were all normal. And, we, and at the same time, the gorillas all looked healthy, which was great, and they had started to settle down. However, I was really touched that one of the poachers had a mask with saying in memory of Rafiki. The local community was very upset that Rafiki was killed because they understand what tourism has done for their community. They were very, very, very upset. And so we felt that we really needed to do something to help the local community. And what we did is we've started a project of fast growing seedlings to address hunger in the local communities where we are distributing um, fast growing crops like potatoes, mushrooms, beans, kale, cabbage, and to grow in their farms so that they don't have to, in their gardens, so that they don't have to enter the park to poach because they're hungry. And in this way, we're hoping to reach the most vulnerable like the poacher. At the same time, we're also engaging reform poachers, telling them not to go back to poach and telling their fellow poachers not to go back to poach by giving them group livestock projects. I would like to end on a happy note. We've had a baby boom in Uganda recently um, in Bwindi National Park and Mugahinga. We've had six new infant gorillas in the past six weeks, which is something we're really pleased about. And it just shows that, you know, the wildlife will keep going, you know, um, if you leave them alone. And we're just really pleased that the numbers are growing. In spite of this COVID-19 crisis, we're seeing some good news. And we hope that with all the support we're getting and with additional support that we need to keep make sure that the communities are healthy, the, the people visiting the gorillas are healthy and we're not making them sick and that the, the, seed, the fast growing seedling project can help to reduce hunger in the communities. We hope that these babies will grow to become healthy adults and will continue to have a rise and an increase in the population of gorillas, mountain gorillas. How can you help us? It would be, we really need support to keep these programs going. And you could do this through donating through our website, ctph.org, and following us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And when tourism starts again um, next month, I think the airport's going to open for international travelers. It would be really happy for you to come and visit and meet our team in Bwindi and see the work that we do and volunteer and continue follow us on the, through our e-newsletter as well. Thank you very much.